Kia ora, welcome into the breakdown on this long weekend. It is great to have you with us. And what a weekend of footy it has been around Aotearoa, New Zealand. Wellington, after a 22-year drought, getting it done over Canterbury in the NPC final. Congratulations to South Canterbury and also East Coast in the Heartland Championship. Black Ferns as well to get through today as well at the World Cup, of course, getting one over Scotland as they head towards the quarterfinals. Let's get straight into it. Goldie Mills and Chelsea, great to see you all. Um, Northern Tour, Goldie, kicks off next week. It's almost here. Uh, Japan just around the corner. So I, w- I want to start this with the fact that the reason I want to talk about this to start with is that I'm comfortable with where the Black Ferns are at, the way they're progressing, everything's going well. I'm comfortable that Wellington deserved the, to win the Bunnings NPC. They did that beautifully last night in Christchurch. I'm a little bit uncomfortable. It's been a month since the All Blacks have played and... It hasn't been convincing in 2022. We know that. There's still a lot of things we'd like to learn. So, Mills, Chelsea, I'm interested. Are we we in any danger next weekend when we travel to Tokyo with the number of players that aren't going, that we are ready and prepared to take on Japan who would have seen some firsts happen in 2022, right, Chelsea? Mm. The All Blacks haven't been at their best, clearly improving, but is this the Brave Blossoms big opportunity? Yeah, I think that there's a few things um, here for me, Goldie. The first being, obviously, we've lost a, a fair chunk of our players to um, bereavement and condolences to the, to the Barrett family with that as well. Um, but, but there's some of our leaders in the team, so I think there are some positives that come with that, and it's going to mean that the likes of Stephen Petafeta, Damien McKenzie coming in, um, those, those guys filling those roles are going to have to really step up and take charge during the week. Um, the team has been hasn't been together for four weeks, so there's going to be um, some some relearnings going on, um, some new combinations coming in with new guys. Um, And the other thing is, there's there's four tests, and I don't imagine... um, I don't imagine a player is going to play all four of those tests. So when are, they, when are we going to rest these players? Is it going to be in the first test against but Japan when they haven't played for four weeks? They've just had a rest. Yeah, exactly. They've just had a month off. So, so does that mean we play our best team in this test? So we rest them for, for Scotland? I'm not sure. It's going to be an interesting week to see, see what unfolds in the All Blacks camp. I, I'm, I'm really interested. In it. I think the big thing for me is that four or five weeks that they've had off and the unconvincing of this whole season. I don't think you can go into this Northern Hemisphere tour and say, hey, this is our sort of practice run for the Rugby World Cup. I think when you're in this sort of camp and what they've sort of had, yeah, they're building really nicely. They've, you know, they've come off a heck of a long sort of a year of off the field. Mm. But I think now's the time for Ian Foster, if I was the coach, to actually build consistency. I think you've got to put your team back out there, albeit, you know, the, the brothers that are, that are away and, you know, Fakatava, who's not there, Will, Will Jordan. Yeah, I know they seem like a lot of, lot of players, but when you look at the leadership, really, Bowden Barrett is probably the, the biggie. So I think he needs to put that same team out that have, have won him the bleeders, the bleeders load and the, um, and the championship. Build consistency around that because they've had a long time off. And so, then you roll into Wales, you know, they might not... I don't think Japan's going to be a threat. I mean, to be honest, I don't think they will be. If we put our, our side out there to, you know, to, to really get into the first 40 to 50 minutes, then I think we can comfortably say, let's rest some of those guys, get them off the park and, and probably build so, a couple of a new, newbies into the team. But you're saying put your best team out there, right? Is that what you're saying? Put the best fit and available team out here. Isn't that what you do in a Rugby World Cup when you get to the the knockout stages of a competition, when you get to the back end, when you're going into your last game to prepare for a quarter final? And remembering the fact that this has been a huge year for the All Blacks, the quality of teams that we have played. The only team outside of the top 10 in the world we are not going to play in 2022 is France. And we played them at the end of last year. So I look at this, Chelsea, and go, you know what? Why wouldn't you have a dress rehearsal and deal with some of the challenges you may face in a Rugby World Cup? when guys get banged up, when they are unavailable through injury or form drops off, and you have to introduce some guys into this environment, this is an opportunity you talked about. There are some positives, but by the same token, we need momentum, right? We need momentum. We need to keep building on that to build confidence. And I just look at it and go, and you mentioned the four test matches as well. You know, which of these four test matches, in theory, would you think is the easiest? Is it Japan? The last time we were in Edinburgh against Scotland... If Stuart Hogg had passed the ball, it's a good chance we lose to them for the very, very first time. So, and this is the back end of a season. I, I look at it, Chelsea, and go, you know what? I, I think we've got to take it very seriously about what we need to achieve in these four weeks because if we don't, we're running out of time. JK talks about it. We're running out of test matches. Yeah, I, I, I agree with building momentum, and, and it is important, and we have been building it throughout the year. But we need to see these players who haven't had much game time. So, like... And, 
no, no, for, for me, put them out in this first test against Japan. Put them out, see how they go. They've got time to then um, code their game, look at, look at the combinations, look at what's worked for them, playing international test footy, because it's different. It's a different ball game. We all know that. And then they get another opportunity later in the tour to play against an even better team, rather than you know, save them for the end of the tour and, and maybe give them a little bit of minutes here and there. I'm talking the likes of Steven Perifeta and those younger guys. Give them a bit more game time because we know what else can happen in a World Cup, and that's injuries, um, other things happen. So we need to know that these guys can step up and play in these big games. He starts at fullback, Mills, right? This, yeah, I, this think game, I, think, I don't think we've got any other options. No Will Jordan. I think by default he does. There's no, I think there's, there's no disagreement that we've got to get guys out there. I, I, I disagree with the fact, and I'll go back to my point. This isn't a Rugby World Cup sort of practice run. What we've got to get out of this, there's two things, all right? Get momentum, which is what we want. You know, we want we want to be we're winning games, but also introduce guys. Okay, so when do we introduce guys? I don't think it's the first game against Japan because of the layoff that the guys have had. I think it's the Scottish test. I think you go in there and you say, well, let's put our best team available. Peter Feta probably gets in there because you know Barrett, Braden Barrett's sort of out. It's a great way to introduce someone into that. You, you lead into the Welsh test and you're humming. This is what you want to do. Okay, the Scottish test, you might want to say, well, is a Roger Tuivasa Sheik? Do we bring him off the bench? Do we introduce another couple of other guys? Because then there's a short turnaround before, and I think that England game has got to be the one that they win. They've got to come away from that end of year tour. Japan, you know, let's get a lead on there after that five week break. Then you go into Wales and you're really humming. You know, maybe, you know, you know pull a few guys out and test a few guys against Scotland. If they lose Scotland, hey, I'm. I'm I'm OK with that. Oh, but I think they come it. away. Stop they, it. You are not OK away, with that. I will be OK. Them. If they come away with the English test and they're really humming, I think they'll, they'll, they'll go into you know, 2024 really confident. Goldie, Japan will be looking at this. Jamie Jace will be looking at the All Black season and he would have you know, seen some deficiencies as all of the sides that we came up, up against did. Uh, what do you think he's thinking? Because there's a lot of talk over in Japan that they could do a hit job on the All Blacks. Well, oh, look, uh, him and Tony Brown will be preparing for an opportunity. Look, in the middle of the year, they had France at home and they performed admirably. They put themselves in a contest, had a chance to um, beat you know, the number one, number two ranked um, side in the world. So Japan will be looking at this, but in saying that, they've played very little rugby mm. in the last three seasons, very little international rugby. They themselves will be looking at who their team is, who their squad is, they're putting together, and whether or not they're looking towards the future, but the here and the now is, in 2022, Chelsea, the All Blacks have been vulnerable. There have been games that they haven't performed at their best. They started to show some signs, but still moments away from losing to South Africa, losing to Argentina, it's taking, um, losing to Australia in the last moments. There's been some opportunities, and this is a Japan team that will see this as a chance. It's still an outside chance, to your point. Well, Mel, since the late 90s, we haven't been in a position where we've lost four test matches heading into a Northern Tour. So if you're Ian Foster and the coaching staff, what sort of mindset does he have? Because as you've kind of alluded to, they have to take one test at a time and just get these out of the way and win these test matches. We don't really have the luxury in this cycle, do we, heading into a World Cup of going, OK, well, we can experiment and make matches. He's just said he's prepared to lose to Scotland. I, I am. Look, I think, I think right now it's different. It's a really good chance to say, well, you know, let's reinvent the wheel. You know, we've gone into Rugby World Cups with the... You know, plenty of comp. This is a time for Ian Foster now to go. Okay, cool. I'm I'm set in stone here. You know, we know what we're, we're absolutely doing. So when we rock up to to Japan, I'm. This is what we want to get out of it. I think building momentum. We haven't lost four Test matches in one calendar year. So. He needs to continue that. He needs the confidence within that team. So hence the reason why I say, you know, get the map back out there against Japan. OK, if it takes, hopefully it doesn't take the whole 80 minutes and we're not, you know, sort of an arm wrestle. But I think, if it, you know, realistically, if it takes 40 or 50 minutes, then start getting them off. And then you roll into, the, you know, the, the, the Scotland, uh, the Welsh game, and you're really fizzing. You know, you're, you're hammering that game. You introduce a few new guys, plus a few guys that have come back from injury into that sort of Scotland tour, and then you hammer that last test again, you know? Whereas in the past, we've gone over there to win absolutely everything. We haven't got that luxury, and I think it's a real, I think it's, a, it's something that will probably motivate Ian Foster, because this is something different. We've never gone into a rugby World Cup being under this much pressure, but I think what he needs to gain first and foremost is the confidence within his team, and, and that's where consistency of selection, especially in that first game, will come into play. Goldie, we started to see it toward the end of the rugby championship, a bit of consistency in combination and combination and key players getting into form, but let's just take a look at the uh, the injuries uh, to the All Blacks and uh, indeed the ones coming in from the All Blacks 15. 
how unsettling is this, guys, uh, as we head toward the Northern Tour, uh, in particular uh, Goldie with, uh, with combinations? Look, I, I, and Chelsea touched on it, and, and I'm interested in Chelsea's thoughts as well. When you see those quality of players, and, and uh, clearly our thoughts go out to the Barrett family who are dealing, uh, dealing with the loss of the gra uh, their grandmother. And, and But they're huge, huge experienced players, Chelsea, that you talked about that leadership, but also integral in the way that we can play. Are there some guys that you think are going to be getting their opportunity and it's going to have wider ramifications going into next season? They might only get one chance. Are there some players that are in that boat? Yeah, oh, definitely. I mean, every opportunity any player gets at international test level, you guys know that, is a chance for them to put their hand up and show what they can do, a chance for them to work with different combinations and, and show how they could potentially play together. So, yeah, I think, obviously, with the Barrett brothers, not, not only what we lose on the field, but like I touched on before, it's, it's the off-the-field stuff leading into a test week. There's so many... There's so many things you do as a player off the field that are run by leaders, such as um, you know pre previewing a game, reviewing past games, um, running meetings with different groups, insides, outsides, and I, I know the Barretts would be leading a lot of that. So, like I said, there's a chance for some of the guys who have been in the team for a few years to really step up and have a voice and not have um, those older players there just, just running the show. So it's going to be interesting to see um, the dynamic of the team and who really steps up and owns those types of roles, the on-field decision, who takes over um, the kicking, if Barrett's not on the field, if Mwanga's also not on the field, if we do play Peter Feta at 10 or, or if DMAC comes on. Um, I'm also really interested to see who, who's going to call the shots with, with the selection in the All Blacks 15, and I know we're going to um, talk about that a bit more later, but are some of those guys who might, might not get the opportunity in the Japan game because we're building momentum, are we going to see them go and get their international test experience in the All Blacks 15? So, again, just an interesting few weeks with selections coming up. What we do know is we know the four guys that are covering the, the key positions. Yeah. Safa Hamu is one of them, Damian McKenzie, Patrick uh, Tui Pilotu, and then Brad Weber. You mm. know, you talk about key positions, hookers and halfbacks. And none, and none of them are new to the All Blacks team. No, so. no, but by, by the same token, what impact are they going to have? Are they there simply for cover? And then do they push back to the All Blacks 15? And mm. how unsettling is that sort of thing, Mills? And then the other side of it too is playing in the Northern Hemisphere is quite different to playing in Australia and South Africa. And we, yet the conditions will be vastly different. And we know the types of teams that we're going to be up against and the way that they're going to play. And we've got to make adjustments then. So there's clearly a way that we want to play. And we've talked about that all season. And Ian Foster's talked about the fact we feel as though the building blocks are there. Are we going to have to have a game game plan B on this tour after Japan for a Northern Hemisphere challenge, remembering that this is not too long after a Rugby World Cup's going to be played, you know, in the back end of November. So uh, uh, can we execute a game plan B, given the fact some key pieces of the puzzle might not initially be there? No, you're totally right about the game plan and what sort of what they go into. I think, and also the way they ended up you know, the results from last year's NDV tour. So oh, that'll be, you know, thoroughly on in the back of Ian Foster's mind, the fact that, you know, he's got to go over there and play differently. The style of rugby is certainly different. Um, the physicality that you're going to get, particularly at the, at the breakdown and some of the, you know, ball carrying from some of the Northern Hemisphere teams of, you know, ferocious. So they've got to try and adapt to that. And, and I suppose part of that is, you know, what have they come up with? You know, to, to implement their style, you know, hard and fast, above the on top of the ground as opposed to, you know, uh, trudging along. That's something they're going to have to try and, and really, really, really nail. And, and can they do it? Well, hey, they've had plenty of time to think about it. And I think they need to be able to do that because, you know, they hurt last year when they went over there and lost those two games, uh, you, know, um, you know, against the Irish and, and, and the French. They're going to be up against a massive challenge. So um, it's going to be a big task for, for Ian Foster's team. I don't, I don't think you can go into a World Cup without having a plan B and a plan C. You can't win a World Cup without being able to adapt to the different types of teams you're playing with. So... I want to see a change up from. I hate talking Plan Bs and Plan A like, <laughs> uh, because 2007 we had Plan A, B, and C and didn't even make the semi-finals. Oh, and so, but I think I know we've come a long way since that. But I think you're right. We, we yeah. definitely need to have something, you know, you know, totally different. The, the good thing at the but, moment, after the Bledisloe over the championship, is that they seem to be on you know, the same page, which is something that we didn't quite see against the, the Irish, uh, you know, the, um, the June, June series. For Leo McDonald and uh, Clayton McMillan and his team, for, uh, for the All Blacks 15, it's got really challenging all of a sudden. Yeah. So after the Japan game, six days later, they've got to play Island A. Mm -hmm. And so a number of the players, I'm sure, who are going up to Japan will then 
then cross back, surely, because they haven't announced any replacements, and there's been a huge number of injuries. Um, uh, McAllister and Bell, they got banged up in the final yesterday. Uh, Oli Yeager's out. He's out for a, a, a significant amount of time. No Angus Tarval, no Bryn Gatlin, but then you've taken... Patrick Tupolo too, Brad Webber, Damian McKenzie, yeah. integral parts out of that group mm. as they're preparing for their game. I, I look at this right now and, and, and I think about this, this All Blacks 15 group, how easy it is going to be, and, and I'm sure there's a number of aggrieved um, Wellington uh, players who would like to be a part of that, but all of a sudden that group's got really small yeah. and trying to prepare is going to be very, very difficult. I mean, this is, once again, I'm not sure this All Blacks 15 tour now after being four games reduced to two and with the circumstances we're facing it is any easy task. No, well, definitely not. But that, again, like I said before, it's going to be interesting to see selections and who, who's going to be actually making those selections. Is it going to be the All Blacks 15s coaches or is it going to be Ian Foster and the team because they want to make the selections that they want to see um, to be you know, the, the backup players for the All Blacks in case of any injuries leading into a World Cup. So, but the, the thing that, that will be hard for that All Blacks 15 team is you've lost, you've lost your 9 and 10. So uh, when you're preparing for a test, mm. as you guys know, they're running the show. So you, you've still got Peter Nata there, and I know he'll be disappointed to, to miss out on the call-up, but you've lost Brad Weber and Damian McKenzie, who, are, who, who is a combination who's been um, tried and tested and true. Um, so their, pre their preparation is, is not going to be as good because flying from Japan to the Northern Hemisphere with a six-day turnaround after potentially playing a test match as well, is, it's tough on the body. So, I mean, what, what, what is it actually catered for? I mean, let's be honest. Yeah. The, the All Black coaches named the, the All Black 15. So when you've got those, those guys coming over, isn't, it, isn't this tour catered around the All Blacks? The All Blacks, It's yeah. not catered around yeah. the All Blacks 15. Mm -hmm. And that's probably where you know, Leo Corrali feels a little bit aggrieved about it because it's not the best team. Indeed, and uh, we will hear from Leo Crowley after the break. Excellent effort from Wellington in Christchurch lifting uh, the MPC Championship. The first time in 22 years. That's on the other side here on The Breakdown. rugby season, Bunnings NPC final in Christchurch. This is a rivalry that has produced some of the great games of New Zealand provincial rugby, be it Ranfurly Shield or National Championship. And away comes Duplessis Kenipi, breaking tackles for Ruben Love, sprinting for the corner and Mardelli! T-Hockey unloads Mardelli! Try! Guy, pick and go for now. No my hook and my welcome back to the breakdown. Yes, Wellington, 22 years in the making. Another title back on top of New Zealand rugby to go with the Ranfilly Shield. Uh, they lifted this year as uh, well. Goldie, Punivai at the end, the try. You think the comeback is on, as we've seen over the years with Canterbury. But is this a Wellington side that just knew how to win on that day and have come of age? For 78 minutes of this game, Wellington were the best team on, on the park. In saying that, though, both teams produced an outstanding game of rugby, whether it be on attack or defence. There were plenty of line breaks, there was desperation, there was physicality. Both set pieces were pretty good. You know, um, the breakdown was really clean. Brendan Prickerall did a fantastic job refereeing it. So overall, as a spectacle, as a game, it was great to be there. It was a perfect evening in Christchurch. I maybe would like to have seen a few more fans. I really would like to say that this is an MPC final. But in terms of the quality, Chelsea Mills, I'll go with you, Chelsea, you watched it. Um, you were home with family, enjoying it's a spectacle after the Black Ferns performance, but I mean they were the best side and they proved it on the night. Yeah, it was a great game to watch, like you said, Goldie. And for me, I, there was no particular team I was going for. I was probably leaning to more, to, <laughs> more towards Wellington just because I've been down to Canterbury and played in finals and I know how hard it is to come away with the championship, which is why we saw the amount of emotion in that Wellington team. And for them to not have won in, is it 22 years? 22 years since they've won. Um, 
it, it just showed to me that Wellington team, it showed the type of culture they had and I think that was led a lot by their fantastic leaders in the team. Obviously TJ Pedernara, um, Duplessis, Karifi, both had, it, had outstanding games and in those really crux moments in the game, particularly at the end when Canterbury started coming back, you just saw TJ start controlling the game, um, you know, organising the forwards around. You saw Duplessis work around the breakdown and the big hits he was putting on and he just, he went all day. I was so impressed. I've been impressed with him all all year, so I'm I'm stoked that Wellington won that game, and and like you said, just an outstanding game of footy to watch. Oh, it's an awesome spectacle, wasn't it? And like you said, Goldie, the, the fact that both teams actually you know played, you know, the whole the whole time, you know, and there's um, the skill set, and particularly this guy here who's led all season, Dupasi Karifi, you know, um, he was outstanding last night once again. This opening try that you know off a uh, off a turn turnover at line out, um, it was a, it was a fantastic game. And like uh, you know, there was a segment there when we came out just after the break, and we thought, okay, they were going to get into a kicking duel. It only lasted a few sort of minutes, and then you know they're out and started playing. And so the skill set for me was amazing. It still had that that feeling though. The first 40 minutes, both teams took a few more chances, and then recognised it was going to be a close contest and not a high-scoring contest. So tactically, they had to play smartly. But there's no doubt for me when I look at both sides, the Super Rugby experience came through. Yes. The Canterbury side had a number of players who had tasted Super Rugby, but not over a long period of time. And I think the work that was done inside that um, Wellington group, the Lions and Leo Crowley's experience as a coach, and he's been coaching for a long, long time, it brought them together and having the likes of a TJ Perinara, who managed to play the, the last couple of critical minutes in the game as well, came back off the bench to have an impact to try and settle his team down because Canterbury made their last push. We've seen it so many times before. We almost expected one last, one last play. But overall, you know, I think the experience of that Wellington group, even the likes of a, um, a Jackson Garden Bishop, you know, who got subbed after 60 minutes, controlled the game really, really well, had done that for the last month and a half. So I look at the group and go, you know what? Experience across the board played a huge part in this result. Full of praise for Wellington uh, tonight, Goldie. Uh, last week, he actually <laughs> picked Wellington. Everyone on the breakdown picked Wellington, but for some reason, in the space of a week, he changed his mind. Let's take a look. I think they can do it. I genuinely you believe think, you they think Wellington think, can do it. I think Wellington can do it. I think they can go into Christchurch. I think with Julian Savia, Ruben Love in the form that he is in, so the way TJ Piranawa, uh, Duplessis Karifi, there's enough experience in that group to understand the big moment, to understand what they need to go down and win. They can, they will. I believe Wellington, the Lions, will be crowned champions this weekend, but I've jumped off a few bandwagons. <laughs> I said Waikato, then I said North Harbour. <laughs> North Harbour got, uh, got ripped off, to be fair. What do you reckon, JK? Have you seen that poll up there? <laughs> it's got all of those titles That's telling you, you your mind, that you? Canterbury, and I've changed my mind. I've flipped the script. I think Canterbury. I'm going to my southern roots. I'm going and calling it. I think Canterbury are going to suffocate this Wellington team, and they're going to win 1-12. to 12. <laughs> so so much passion. <laughs> so uh, both made sense, right? Uh, both made sense. Um, look, I, I can tell you sort of what happened. It had been a long week, and uh, clearly I was down in Christchurch, and I felt it was safer for me <laughs> after what I said last weekend. Look, um, like Mills and Taylor, too. Mills and Taylor went Wellington, and I thought, you know what? Just to make it interesting, just in case Canterbury won, I could have a really enjoyable post-match show. Um, look, deep down, I did, I did, like I said, I did think Wellington were the team, but I thought Canterbury at home, I looked at that light pole and maybe... Either I way, blind, compelling blind. argument, either way. The pole, you well, looked I, up. That was almost, that was, it was like Mills has sat on so many fences <laughs> on this <laughs> show. Put it on me, mate. Yeah, I just decided... I we, go, we go to your yeah. picks nice and early next, next um, you know, pre-match. Yeah, but I've got, like I said, I'd pick North yeah. Harbour, I'd pick Waikato. I mean, I'd been everywhere in this <laughs> NPC. That just shows you the quality of the, the competition, how close it was, you know, in, in the last hurdle... I got it wrong. All right. Let's, let's talk about the, the competition, guys. The NPC came back to, to, the, to the one format this year. Mills, a success as far as you're concerned? I think so. Absolutely it was a success. And I think the two best teams, you know, last night, um, you know, played, played in that final. Um, how does it look next year? Um, it'll be interesting to see 
Chelsea, um, you know, just the way they sort of play out the pools and, you know, who goes in the odds or the evens or sort of what, what they name it as well. But definitely, uh, the format for me was fantastic. Yeah, I do agree 100%. I thought the, the format was out, was outstanding this year. It gave everyone a shot at the championship. And I think it, it shows by um, the amount of different teams who have won it over the last three years that it's not just the same teams. Obviously, some teams are more consistent than, than others over the years, but um, with, with players coming in and out, um, and all over the country now, any team can really challenge to, to be championship. And I, I didn't like it when there's the, sorry, the premiership and the championship, mm. when some of the championship teams are, are winning all their games. And we could see that they'd be able to beat a lot of the premiership teams, but the draw just didn't work out. Jeff, you look like you, you want to disagree uh, over well, there. Well, what, what, what I'm looking at here, though, is the fact that in the end, the teams that were deepest with Super Rugby players yeah. are the ones that contended for a title. Sure. And so realistically, not every team, I think, is going to have a chance to go on and win. Now, there were but, a few but surprises it makes those this teams year. Better. Well, uh, if I, I look at the season of Northland. Mm -hmm. I thought they did a fantastic job. But in saying that, they did have a number of really good Super Rugby players in their squad. And so not many competitions around the world are balanced and even and talent spread. And NPC should be reflective of what you've got, first and foremost, in your province, what you can produce locally, what you can develop and become a, a provincial player for you. And that needs to be really critical. Mm -hmm. And if I think if we can get down that path, maybe we'll see more performances like Northlands. Mm -hmm. Southland and a Manawatu might find a way to be yeah. more competitive. But at the moment, it's going to be, I think, very difficult for them given that the nature of the 14 teams, it's tough for those sides. I think the, the massive benefit here, though, is if you're a player from one of the smaller provinces, and we, we see it happen in the women's game in FPC because it is split, some of the girls that are selected in the Black Ferns team, say, for example, out of Taranaki, they don't want to go back and play for their home province um, simply because they're not playing against the best players in the country because they don't get to play in the Premiership. So I hope that making the competition like this, you'll have some of the guys that are from Northland thinking, well, actually, I'm actually going to be able to play against the best players in the world. I'm going to be able to play with and against Super Rugby players. So, yeah, I will go back and play for Northland rather than going to pick one of the biggest regions who have, who have already stacked with Super players. Well, what you have to, though, if you're going to do this, you have to leave spots available in Super Rugby to select some of these guys on form. Yeah. If you're, you want a player to stay down and play against the best and play for South and the Manawatu, so to stay locally at home and go, you know what, I'm going to be judged on my form here, playing against the guys out of Canterbury, playing the best guys out of Wellington and Auckland, so that, you know what, if I step up there, there has to be somewhere for me to go. And at the moment, there's not enough of those spaces to value the NPC the way it should be valued. There's not enough spots available in Super Rugby. Before the NPC even starts, and we need to find a way yeah, to open up that, those doors. That's why we're seeing a lot of the players go and play in the likes of the Major League over in USA or, right. or in other club teams around the world, because that's their opportunity. So... Yeah, I agree. With well, a number of those players in the final uh, last night uh, for the Lions, outstanding Diplicy Karifi, Billy Proctor, Xavier Numea, not a part of uh, the end of year tour, or indeed the All Blacks 15. Leo Crowley, and quite rightly, he used his moment, he used his platform after the Wellington win. Let's take a look at what uh, the Wellington coach said uh, about uh, some of his players perhaps missing out on a spot in those teams. Yeah, and oh, yeah, I'm going to put it out there. We're disappointed we've only got three boys in that All Black 15, yep. and two of them are All Blacks. Yeah. So, hey, we're 10 in a row here now, and we've had a really good set. How can we not get Billy Popter and a few others in that team? Makes a good point. Makes a great point, Goldie. Like, some of those players been playing out of their skins and, and led them to that title. Um, James Blackwell yeah, uh, for, for Wellington. You know, an outstanding lock. Um, and, and watching him firsthand, I, I look at the, the two guys he was up against and, and young Gallagher and, um, and Dominic Gardner and, and I thought he outperformed them uh, in the bigger stage. Uh, there's no doubt the potential of those young players, but I look at the hard-working player like he was, Dominic Bird, who's been an all-black mm. before, really, really good. Once again, those doors, you'd like to think they're continually open. And I think there's a number of players, Mills, Chelsea, that can look at their seasons and go, you know what, Peter Lakai, you know? Absolutely. I think he'll go close to being the... NPC Player of the Year. The fact that he hasn't, he's missed an opportunity. So, in some ways, I think Leo Crowley's got a point. I, I think it just comes back to my point about 
the All Black coaches picking the side and what what they're catering it for. Are they catering it for the All Blacks for the well for for the, possibly the Rugby the World Cup? Yeah, the future a little bit, but the future in terms of the Rugby World Cup because if they normally you, you pick a 15 that's the best guys for the future in terms of two or three years. You know, the likes of you know, if you look at where well, he, he mentioned Billy Proctor, right? And I thought he had he's had an outstanding yeah. season. You know, he's, last night as well his defensive effort was 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 awesome. He came out of out of line, but he sort of adjusted really well. His defensive um, stuff was awesome. But if you look at the guys that made the 15, and Billy Proctor, they they picked oh more Nankerville. You know, those probably are the sort of the guys you think you know, you know, who do you, do do you replace them with? And if you look at those two names, they're possibly looking at those those two guys as maybe making the All Blacks for the Rugby World Cup if we need them. And that's probably why he's missed out. If you're naming it and naming an All Black 15 based on you know the, the second best best team, they're not worrying about the Rugby World Cup. Then I think a lot of those guys should would would make it. You know, um, and unfortunately, Mir's probably a, a, another one. But a lot of injuries have come into play in the propping department. So perhaps you know he's his name is now you know being put out there. Um, but I, I I agree with you. You know, Bird in that Bird last night. You know, Blackwell. Those are guys. You know, um, hope that you're hoping the doors open. Not possibly for next year. And that's why the coaches have picked those that, that would all black fifty. Yeah. Charles, what what more does Duplicity could ever need to do. I mean, he, he offers something slightly different, doesn't he, to the rest of the loose forwards around the country. We've talked about that before. What, what more can the guy do to, it's funny, to make his way in? Yeah, it's funny you say that, Jeff, because I was sitting on the couch with my husband last night and we were saying the exact same thing to each other. He was breaking lines on attack. He was giving unreal offloads like he was a midfielder. He was um, leading the defensive line, putting big hits on. He was great over the ball and he goes all day. Plus, he's a great leader, which you want in a, in a good um, open side flanker. So it is tough, but... You know, with all these selections, selection is really tough and there's always going to be some quality guys that get left out. What I, my hope is, is that these All Black selectors and these All Blacks 15 selectors, they've reached out to these guys. They're and, one and the same. And, <laughs> They're the same well, people. Exactly. But that's the reality and the fact that that, I think, explains what Mills is talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. I hope they've re reached out to these guys and, and commended them for, you know, ha having their uh, a stellar season and explain to them what the role of the All Blacks 15 is, because we're still unsure. We've talked about it week after week. Well, is, it, I, is it a development team? Is it a exactly form 15? Exactly that. And I think it's know. developing players to play the international game. And I think for Duplessis Karifi, if you look at the role of seven players at the highest level now, and you talk about that, that genuine feature, which is what he is, on every given breakdown he gets an opportunity and that's where he's improved his discipline as well, his accuracy. He used to give away a lot of penalties. It used to frustrate me watching him because he wasn't making good enough decisions whereas now technique's outstanding. But if you watch the game at the highest level now, those turnovers are getting less and less. The physicality is what's required in terms of your presence, your ability to hit. He's probably on the light side. Yeah. You know, for a seven, you think about Sam Kane, Peter Steff, Have you seen his quads he's... though? Yeah, I know. <laughs> that guy has got me. But, but uh, once again, and you start going, Doesn't let's not, let's, and I understand where Leo Crowley's coming from, but remember the NPC is not super rugby. Mm. Super rugby is not test match level, you know, and so the jumps that you're talking about to be eff effective at the highest level is, I think, maybe just slightly different. But I was impressed with a number of guys, and, and in particular, there's two I want to talk about. I thought Billy Harmon was really good at number eight. I think his versatility in that position, skill set, and Ruben Love. Mm. He's one out of the box. He is, he is exciting to watch. I'd like to see him goal kick more, because I know he can, but man, um, there's some talent there. Yeah, Whether it's confident. a fullback, we've got to yeah. find out what his position is next year for the Hurricanes. Yeah, yeah. All right, for the Hurricanes, where's he going to play? Sorry, I'll keep going. That's you all right. You, you made a good point, yeah. Mills, too, about uh, you hope that the phone call is made because we are in a World Cup, leading up to a World Cup cycle, a World Cup next year. You hope that some of those guys that are on the fringe have just maybe missed out, get. Uh, get, 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 that, get that word and, hey, look, you know, keep doing what you're doing because next cycle you'll be right in there. Um, we need to talk about uh, South Canterbury and uh, the Meads Cup. Another unbeaten season uh, down at uh, Pleasant Point uh, Domain. Simply outstanding uh, getting the win over Whanganui. And uh, we'll take a look at the highlights on a beautiful day. And, uh, well, this is really the turning point. Leti Nganga from South Canterbury, the intercept. Fortunate enough to be there with Ben Castle and Joe Wheeler calling that one, guys. Uh, but Goldie, you, you sort of talked about fan engagement, and um, we just seem to see it on a different level on the Heartland. And, and I think this this scene yeah, right yeah, here just Good. epitomises that <laughs> because it's close to club rugby. Yeah, that's what it is. It's closer to club rugby. These are players who just play in their local club competitions, who have jobs that they go back to. They train on a Tuesday and Thursday night. They play Some of them fun. might go for the odd run. They're playing for the pure enjoyment, and their fans know them. 
the, their fans are their families, Chelsea. Isn't that right? That's the, and, and, and it's very much closer probably to FPC, is mm. the fact that all of a sudden there's a, there's a different feel about it. And it's great to see. It's a, at a stadium. It's not a stadium. It's at the local club ground, mm. you know, and that's closer and more connected to it. And but Chelsea, they could perhaps learn from this, couldn't they? Because uh, obviously Alpine Energy uh, down in Timaru out of action, so they took it on the road, uh, South Canary, around the grounds. But uh, I think smaller grounds, would, would you agree, w could be the option going forward. No one wants to see an empty stadium in the NPC. Well, when, when Goldie told us that half of the stand wasn't full in an in NPC but final... Half I, of the stadium wasn't open. I couldn't... I couldn't believe it. So, yeah, I, I think bringing... Um, the NPC games aren't selling tickets like they used to. So if an Auckland's playing in, in Eden Park every weekend and, and hardly selling any tickets, why not take it to a smaller ground, make tickets cheaper, get families along and, and get more of a, you know, rugby community feel? I think, um, like, like we, you talked about with South Canary, those guys are really relatable. They're out in the community. You might see one of them build it, building your house, doing renos on your house, and then you get to go watch them on the weekend. And that's really relatable for the community. So maybe something that these NPC teams could do as well. And, and Wayne Smith's massive on this. He, he's got the Black Ferns doing this at least three times a week in different groups. And that's really getting in touch with the community and being really... Um, being really open, open with them and letting them get to know you a bit better. And I think that's, that's probably why some of these Heartland teams uh, get the crowds and get the buy-in that they do from, from their provinces. It was a brilliant day. It, uh, it was uh, a great day down Why at Why are Pleasant you Point. smiling so much? Well, well, what, 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 it, 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 it had it all. There were, there were pigs on, on the spit. Uh, Joey Wheeler was, was, was frothing. Oh, he now was it explains it. everything. <laughs> yeah, that that explains feed, everything. Joey Wheeler's floating around. He was fighting around <laughs> and he caught up with the South Canterbury boys in the sheds after the win. Heartland side. Well, there's a special celebration. <laughs> I know, just happy for the boys. It's been a good day. <laughs> South Canterbury, baby. <laughs> South Canterbury. <laughs> there he is, the big prop, the big man. What an impact you had on the game, eh? Came on, made a huge impact. You must be, you'll be loving it tonight. You'll be right in the thick of it, I'd imagine. Oh, f yeah, mate. Nah. <laughs> Sorry, mate. I'm just, I'm just one of the cogs in the team, you know. Nah, it's a full team effort. I think that's the difference. We've got so much depth in this team that if someone goes down, we can bring someone in, he does just as good as a job, and that's the key to what today was, really. Yeah. Who's going to set the tone over the next few days? Who do, they, who do, who do Tim are to look out for? That little piss Willie Wright. <laughs> <laughs> one condition about the, the budgie smugglers and the cheese cutter, when you wear that, you've got to lead from the front. They don't come off. They don't come off for three days. Neither does that jersey. Three days. Three days. Too f***ing easy. Wow, <laughs> wow. I'll send you a picture, baby. Good <laughs> right on you, mate. Yeah, Special day for you, mate, eh? Back to back champs, and then just got named in the Heartland side. Oh, it's unreal. What, what, what a way to do it, eh? Like, especially with this bunch of lads, awesome. All family, so good, so good. I see you're right in the thick of the celebrations. Is that the way it's going to be over the next couple of days? You leading the charge? I don't know, but I'll, I'll sure I'll be there. I'll be there. <laughs> then I'll be the front runner, but I'll be in behind the boys. Special group, eh? Yeah, it's such a special group, and like, you know, you get an injury and there's five other guys behind you ready to come in and do the job with you, eh? Like, it's unreal. Like, obviously, we had injuries. Like, Zach Mackay played 80 minutes every week and get injured. And then Zach Saunders to come in and you wouldn't even know. He's been, you know, guys like that just make the team so special, eh? Oh, enjoy the night, mate! Woo! Does, still, does anyone know no. if Joe Wheeler's home? We yet? haven't heard from Joey. <laughs> Joey's gone. He's there. gone AWOL. We haven't heard from Joey. <laughs> oh, we know where he is. We know where he is. He's in the South Island somewhere. Hey, look, look, Craig Calder, the Canterbury, uh, South Canterbury uh, rugby CEO, after seven uh, years, uh, Goldie, um, has called it a day. Before Sir Colin died, he had a chat to him and he said, look, look after the Heartland game, keep New Zealand rugby accountable. If we're talking about being relatable and staying in touch with the game, those scenes in South Canterbury, I mean, that, that says it all. There, there is still a real beating heart. And, uh, and it was just wonderful to see. Well, that's their, that's, that's their dream, is, you know, for those guys. That's their reality. That's, they've got no aspirations of being... Oh, some may do, but they, they understand the fact that they're going from club rugby, they're going to play in this competition, which is incredibly close to the mills, and you can see how much it means to them. Yeah. And any title you can win, any title you can be a part of, a, a championship run, 
the celebrations and the feeling you get from it. I, I genuinely don't think it changes whether it be a club title, whether it be a school title, because it takes a lot of hard work. And you think about the disciplines of those men, where they go to, where they work probably eight till six, they get to training, they've got families who are supporting and putting them through it, wives and partners and kids, and there'll be some issues the next couple of days, I don't doubt that 100%, <laughs> but they'll celebrate and they'll celebrate it in style, you know, and sometimes the professional arm can forget mm, that. Yeah. You can lose sight of that, Mills, yeah. whereas that should always bring you back to reality of, you know, and that's why you see some guys at the end of their careers have a couple of few extra years playing in the Heartland game. Not quite ready to give it, let it go, because they want to be part of something like that. Well, we saw that Mills with, with, with Ma'a. We'll move on to, um, to East Coast. Uh, I mean, incredible, incredible story. It wasn't that long ago they couldn't buy a win. 54-game losing streak. And uh, Jose Gere was, was involved as well. They've turned things around. They won the Lahore Cup. I mean, this is, uh, this is magic, isn't it, for, for Heartland rugby to see a team like that that have been doing it so tough to, to now be standing on top. Oh, it's amazing, isn't it? And... Uh, this is, Heartland Rugby is a big part of New Zealand Rugby. It's a big part of history. It's the emotional side of, of things. It's where majority of, you know, your, your sort of upbringing into the rugby scene comes from, you know, your club rugby stuff. Not so much nowadays, and you're right, Goldie. It's so important that we don't lose that touch. And you, you mentioned it, Chelsea, that, you know, Smithy, you know, brings that in. We also did that at the All Blacks, and I know they still do. They touch on the club that you're absolutely from because, that's where you draw a lot of emotion from when you go on end of year tours. Yeah, yeah, you know your roots back to your, your, your club, the history behind um, you know club rugby and, and also Heartland Rugby in New Zealand. It's 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 strong, and that's why you're right. When guys come back, they want to be a part of that because that's where it all, it all began before they became professionals. And it's and, and Chelsea, like like you're saying, it's 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 important that we keep it alive. Yeah, and and as well, these guys they're not playing. Um, for the for the province or the franchise who have picked them up and, and agreed to to pay them a contract, or they're not going where the next contract is. They're playing for their home, and especially these guys down in East Coast, they're they're playing for Nati Paro, their their iwi as well, which is why they get such massive amounts of support from all their friends in Fano. They, they might get a couple imports here and there, but it's more than playing for a job. It's playing for the love of the game, and it's playing from where you're from. And it doesn't need to be on television. Oh, exactly. The locals are going to watch. Mm. They're not. They're not. They're not. You know. Yeah. It's great. It's getting coverage, and we're putting it on. You know. But I look at it and go. You know what? The, the locals are actually going. I'm not going to watch it on TV. I'm going to go to the game. I want to be there firsthand to experience because, like you say, they're my teachers, my plumbers, my builders. My. They could be anything. My policemen, my local. You know, volunteer fire people. That's to me is just. Oh, that's what's so integral and, and and thrilling about it when you when you see. That just that, that everyone is a part of it, and the community I, community I believe, the rugby community, your club rugby community, is closer to that than maybe some other levels. It, it is very similar to the FPC mm -hmm. because it's the same as, as the ladies are doing, and and a lot of people comment on how the ladies are very relatable. It's the same in the heartland and the in the smaller provinces as well, so it's awesome to see the support there. Absolutely. Congratulations to Whanganui and Mid-Canterbury as well on, on fantastic uh, Heartland seasons. Rightio, time now for a wee bit of trivia. Uh, and the trivia this week is, uh, can you guess who this person is? Uh, this is uh, the clue, played for Auckland, played for Manawatu, played for the Blues, and was capped by Wales as well. So there you go. Oh, Who is easy. this? What do you reckon? What do you reckon, uh, Goldie Mills? Too easy, Charles? Mate. Okay, you guys have a think. We'll come back after the break here on the you breakdown. Don't know it. Too easy, mate. <laughs> Kia ora, welcome back to uh, the breakdown trivia. Uh, what do you reckon, Mills? You, you, you said one thing gave it away. Yeah, it was, what was the one thing? The Welsh. What was the one thing? Wales. They've was both got it written down. I think they need to say it at the same it? time. They'll be bickering in the ad break. Hadley Parks. Hadley Parks. That's what I've got written down. It's Hadley Parks. It's definitely hey, It's Hedley a lot Parks. smaller then. <laughs> Hadley Parks. Come on now. Show us the answer. 100% There Hedley it is. Parks. Hadley Parks. Yeah. Smart rugby player he was. Really, really balanced. You know, it's good. really bounced high. And great for Wales too. Yeah, played really, really well. Was that Declan O'Donnell tackling him in that photo? That wasn't the question, that? Chelsea. What <laughs> the, what the, I don't, <laughs> was it was a Waikato player. It wasn't who were tackling him, but, but I was getting bonus points. It was a Waikato player. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the most. Uh, okay, bonus points. <laughs> I don't know. Half a point. 
Maybe. Chelsea, the, uh, Seriously. the World Cup has been, uh, has been riveting to watch. It's been exciting. Uh, the Black Ferns on a roll, uh, getting past Scotland and, and pool play with, uh, with relative ease. But we, I guess we're at a point now, Wayne Smith is at a point now where he's got to start making some, some pretty big decisions heading into the knockout stages, particularly in, the, in that back three. How do you see the balance of this team and, and some of those decisions heading into the business end? Yeah, well, it was exciting, isn't it? We're heading into quarterfinals this weekend, so we are getting to the business end. Um, looking like like black friends will be playing Wales so still let's be honest they're, they're still not going to get tested until the semi so um, there was a really cool picture though that I saw on Instagram if we talk about the back, back three and um, it was the sideline the girls that weren't stripped and it was Stacey Flula, Ruby Tui, Portia Woodman and uh, one, of, one other girl and I'm just thinking after the display that they just put on these girls still have to come back in the team. And it's, oh, it was Kennedy Simon, sorry. Yeah. Kennedy Simon, the co-captain as well. These four are on the sideline and they're all available this weekend. What does he do? It's a tough one. Do you, do you um, let go of, of Renee Holmes again, who came back and played an outstanding game and is the top goal kicker? I've got to ask you that. Yeah. I, I, the goal kick is important to me. If, 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 if it's we, huge. She's who, easily If we've best. got a kick yeah. from 40 metres out, when the game is on the line, and not maybe this coming weekend against Wales, we, and look, all respect to Wales, and they definitely did some work uh, up front, and their scrum was very good against the Black Ferns. But my question is, when we get to France, if we get to France, let's say if, and we need a kick from 40 metres out, is Renault Holmes the only one yep. that can make that kick? Yeah. Does she no. have to be... Sorry, her and, and Hazel Trubick. Yes. Can, but Hazel right. Trubick's obviously sitting behind our captain at Oahe, yeah. so she's not going to be on the field at the start of the game, assuming they stick with the same selection. So... That's the, that's the massive question, I guess, because he's going to want to play Portia, Aisha and Ruby, but you're going to have to choose one of them to come on as impact. So who's it going to be if, if you want your best goal kicker on the field? Which, if we're going to be playing France and England, we watched the France and England game and it was tight and it came down. It could come down to kick. So, Mills, we know what Ruby offers as well. Charles, we know what Ruby offers as well, Mills, with the, um, the fact that she's so good over the ball. She's like a, another feature on, on the park. What balance do you go with? Because Wayne Smith has said that Aisha Lefty Inga is, uh, is one of the best players in the world, and you can't really leave Portia Woodman out. So if goal kicking is so crucial heading into that back end, what's your, what's your balance? Well, I'm glad I'm not a coach. Right <laughs> because he, you know, Smitty's going to have a massive headache, you know, um, picking that. But I, I, would, I would say, you know, you, you, you've got to have Holmes out there. I think you've got to have her at, at the back. And Ruby might be the one that actually misses out, you know, the work rate around there. Because are you going for X-factor players? I mean, Smithy says you're the best in the world. You could have a whole, you know, you, he wants the whole team to be the best the best in the world in that, in that position. And then that, that's what you're striving for. So when he says that about certain players, He's picking them, to, picking them to start. You know, I mean, I mean who's going who's gonna to do that? And, and you hope it doesn't come down to that. But I think this is what he's, he's geared the team up to. He's given them plenty of opportunities. And, you know, they, they almost now come down to the, the hard part. Now it comes down to him picking it. And he's, he's very good at that. I guess, Chelsea, you, you talk about impact uh, off the pent, off the pine. Who, who do you go with in that respect? If you think about it that way, would, would Ruby be valuable uh, late in the game? Would Aisha be valuable late in the game, all of, all of that power and that energy coming on with maybe yeah, 20 minutes to go. To me, what Ruby offers um, away from the ball is massive, and, and it's that seventh experience with playing in front of a big crowd, and just her, her demeanour on the field, her ability to stay calm, her ability to lift players up if they're making mistakes, um, that kind of stuff is massive when you've got a team who's relatively inexperienced playing at a World Cup. So I'd have Ruby on the field, and... For me as well, um, Portia and Aisha are very similar types of wingers and, and um, for a bit of inside, inside knowledge here, looking at GPS data, they both, they both produce the same type of GPS data and I'm talking about the amount of high speed metres they covered in comparison to the actual distance they cover, whereas Ruby Tui as a winger covers a whole lot more distance as she's not as much a power winger, she's a working winger. So I wonder if he's going to have Ruby and Renee on the field and then have either Portia or Aisha start with one of them coming off as impact because their type of fitness is different. They're not necessarily 80-minute players. They're absolute powerful beasts of wingers who can change a game. So having either of them at either side of the field, um, either side of the game, sorry, will be massively beneficial. So over to you, Smithy. <laughs> so I look at this and I go, Wayne Smith's going to play a strongest lineup. For this game and go, you know what, this is the team that's going to take us he has through. To. He's going to play us. I think that's the, the, the path he'll go down and the way he'll want to win these games is not going to be with goal kicking. 
He's going to try and it's blow teams off the park and use the skill set, the work through the middle from our forward pack we've seen. I love what they're going to do. I'd like to think it's the same with the All Blacks and we get a double header next weekend. We get two great performances to prepare themselves for the next challenge. Now, you can't pick two sides this week. OK, you have to no, pick no, one well, side. Japan or the All Blacks. I know you're going with, but, but, but by how much? Plenty Thanks. on both sides. I'd love you to say Japan. <laughs> <laughs> you can be different, but I'm not. I'm sticking. I'm taking the low odds this time. I'm going on the real skinny things. Tell you what, it's both the All Blacks and Black Ferns. Game on. Millsy, 13 plus All Blacks for you? Absolutely. Yeah. Confident. Charles, how do you see it? Uh, how do you see it unfolding first? Yeah, I think I think the boys will be refreshed. Um, they've had time with their family. Their bodies will be refreshed. They'll be ready to get back into it. So. I think it's going to be a, a massive score by the ABs. Points to prove by all the players. I agree. You agree? They know, they know what's at stake. McMill said it. They need momentum. They need to get this tour underway with a good win. I think it'll be comprehensive to the All Blacks. Uh, enjoy the rest of your long weekend, uh, Goldie Mills and Chels. And uh, you too, stay safe on the roads, wherever you are around the country, uh, over this Labor weekend. Thanks for joining us here on The Breakdown. We'll catch you again next week as the Northern Tour kicks off for the All Blacks. Black Ferns roll on in the World Cup.